You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. In today's video, John is joined by R.J. Graham. R.J. Graham is a Department of Physics student in Atmospheric Physics at Clarendon Laboratory, working in Ray Pierre Humbert's group at Oxford. Currently, his research is focused on modeling geochemical climate feedbacks on rocky planets. He is supported by a Clarendon scholarship. R.J. Graham, welcome to the program. Hello, thanks for having me. Really, really appreciate it. Uh, respect your science popularization a lot. It's uh, There's nothing on this earth I'd rather be doing than popularizing science, which <laughs> is a good day for that. Life on Venus. Now, Venus is historically, I mean, there was once a time where people thought that Venus had jungles and <laughs> right. you know all kinds of, of uh, life on there. Then we yeah. flew past it with a probe and we saw that this was nothing hospitable. This, this world looked like a hellscape. Hot, yeah. enormous pressure, and there just doesn't seem to be any room for life. But in the years after that, people thought of ways that, well, maybe. And then we find out things like Venus very well may have had an ocean once and have right. had it for several billion years. Yep. Well, that's enough time for life, presumably, if Earth is any indicator. So if that life sitting on the surface of Venus adapted to the increasingly terrible conditions that were presented to it and it went up into the upper atmosphere or the lower atmosphere <laughs> where you have pressures and temperatures comparable to Earth, mm -hmm. it might still be there. Well, today there was an announcement of the discovery of phosphine gas in the atmosphere of Venus, and apparently quite a bit of it. I think it, I heard it was a 15 sigma detection, so it seems like there's quite a lot of this stuff. Yep. Well, is this a dead ringer? Does this tell us that life exists at Venus? It's not a dead ringer. It's not a dead ringer, but we can say that it it's not made by any of the abiotic things that we're aware of that like that we have good models of going on on Venus. And it's not just that, well, okay. So, so you can't, you can make, you can make phosphine abiotically. You can make it through a variety of different chemical pathways, but the question is whether you can make enough of it. Like you said, they had a yeah pretty strong detection of it. It's something like 20 parts per billion in the region where it's occurring that they're seeing it and all of the abiotic pathways they tested. So all of the pathway, like the chem the chemical networks they looked at that didn't have metabolism included fell short by orders of magnitude in terms of producing high enough fluxes of the material to account for that 20 parts per billion. So although I wouldn't say it's a dead ringer, I mean, they, they worked really hard to rule out all of the known abiotic processes. So it's either new unexpected chemistry or yeah, could, yeah, could be biology. But in terms of unexpected chemistry, phosphine is something we use industrially. And yeah. it seems to me we have a good handle on this gas and its reactions. So mm -hmm. that would seem to bolster the case that biology is producing the phosphine in Venus's atmosphere, right? Yeah, 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 I would agree with that. It definitely bolsters the case. Um, but uh, yeah, so we do, yeah, we do have a pretty good handle on how, on how to make phosphine, but we have less good of a handle on the chemistry that's going on in, in Venus's atmosphere, which if we don't have a full characterization of that, then it becomes a lot harder to rule out possibility of some other, you know, mechanism to make it. Also, should have mentioned this before, but there is still some vague possibility that it's not actually phosphine they detected. This is just one spectral feature, like one little feature, whereas if you're detecting molecules spectroscopically, you look, you look kind of like at their, their fingerprint, like the, the, as light passes through an atmosphere, the molecules that are present there will absorb it at certain wavelengths and at like unique wavelengths where you can identify molecules by seeing the absorbed light or which light doesn't, you know, fil doesn't make it out of the atmosphere when the sunlight passes through it. And they, you know, the strongest way to do that is to f 
find multiple features that match up with what you expect. Whereas in this paper, they find a single feature that matches up with what they would expect phosphine to look like, which is fine. Like, and they, they did look at some plausible other candidates that might have been false positives and said that no, those can't be present in high enough abundance to, to, to produce a line, to produce a spectral signature like this. But, you know, that's another one of those, if there are like unexpected sulfur species, for example, up in, in the atmosphere of uh, Venus, it could conceivably produce a similar spectral feature, in which case it could be a false, yeah, false detection. So that's just another caveat to, to, to say, but I would say it's, mo you know, it's most likely phosphine. They worked hard. They worked hard to, 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 to say that with some confidence, but they're, they need, we need like independent confirmations from, from uh, perhaps different regions of the, of the electromagnetic spectrum looking for other features. Now, this is certainly something that's going to happen probably right now. <laughs> somebody, yeah, yeah. somebody is looking and saying, Hmm, now, other bodies in the solar system. Could you look for phosphine at, say, Mars? Yeah, I, I don't know why you why you wouldn't. Yeah, they they certainly should. Now that yeah, now that this is this has happened, and I I would be amazed if they're not. Yeah, uh, and that you know that's another point is that uh, phosphine does occur elsewhere in the solar system on on gas giants like like Jupiter and Saturn, but those environments are fundamentally like totally different from the environment of Venus because Venus is a very oxidized atmosphere. It's, it's almost entirely CO2, whereas these gas giants have very reducing atmospheres, which means they're, they're, largely, they're largely made of hydrogen, and, and, and phosphine's a reduced chemical species. So it's a lot easier to make in these reducing atmospheres, like the gas giants. And so it has been detected elsewhere in the solar system, just to, yeah, you, you were making the point we should look elsewhere. It has been detected elsewhere, but the, the, the chemical context is so different that it doesn't really tell you much about what's, what's going on in Venus. But yeah, we definitely should look at Mars. There's no chance, or there's no, there's no doubt about that. <laughs> so if you see phosphine, say, a trace of it in the atmosphere of Jupiter, it can be explained by the conditions of Jupiter, but the conditions, so far as we understand them regarding Venus, doesn't explain the presence of phosphine or at least this much of it yes absolutely yeah exactly yeah deep inside the gas giants is very hot very high pressure the chemistry you can make you can make phosphine from that chemistry and then it can up well up to the top of the atmosphere where we can observe it but the that chemistry is just totally independent of what would be going on in venus so now venus is much more like earth now say let's flip it around say we're we're sitting there at venus in orbit of it looking at earth could we detect phosphine here in the same way? Probably not, I think, because, okay, so Earth is a, so I, I, I said Venus is oxidized, quote unquote, but Earth is like super oxidized. Earth has a bunch of oxygen, has 20% of the atmosphere's oxygen, and that reacts with phosphine really fast. And so in general, it's at about the part per trillion level, I think, on Earth, although that varies. So like if, you, if you're like, <laughs> if you're measuring phosphine like right above human feces, for example, it, it can be in the parts per billion range, uh, <laughs> or like, you know, right above a swamp where there might be very oxygen poor sediments underneath the, the standing water where you might have anoxic metabolisms going on, that those might produce phosphine. But in bulk on Earth, it's at the part per trillion level. And I don't think it's, I think it's pretty hard to detect spectroscopically from Venus, because I'm pretty, I, if I'm not, if I might, I, I might be, I might be wrong on this, but I'm pretty sure that the like lower limit for their detection on Venus was something like a part per billion. Now the generation of phosphine here on earth by earth life is generally associated with death. In other words, the death and rotting of an organism. So are mm -hmm. we actually detecting potentially what we, what we see at Venus? This is probably rotting bacteria. Mm, so the reason it's associated with death on earth is because of the, types of bacteria that are then metabolizing the dead creature. So even though it's associated with death on earth, it's still a metabolic product from like a living, a living metabolism. So I would say probably, and, and so, and like, and, and the, 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 you have anoxic like creatures that will be inside of you. And when you die, they'll start to yeah, eat you up and produce their, their byproducts. And so, yeah, that's why, why phosphine is associated with, with death here, but I don't think that necessarily would apply to Venus. You just need anoxic microbes and on earth, the place, a one place that anoxic microbes occur in some large quantities is uh, in dead bodies. 
or feces or like sewage, whatever. <laughs> that does not paint a lovely picture of the potential life on Venus. <laughs> now, exoplanets. Now, this 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 actually goes back to a paper that came out, I think, in January, where it was yep. suggested by some of the authors that are also on this paper that we might look at exoplanets for phosphine as well. Yep. And apparently somebody decided, well, let's look at Venus first. Am I exactly. getting that right? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. So I think the first author on the paper you're mentioning is Clara Sousa Silver. And she did her PhD and a lot of her postdoc spent them trying to really, yeah, like dig into phosphine as a potential biosignature. Yeah, that paper from January is kind of the result of years and years of work by her um and as well as you know the people that she worked with but yeah she was yeah initially suggesting it as something to look for once we have james webb up in space and are able to you know start start trying to dissect the atmospheres of rocky planets orbiting other stars but yeah then they were like yeah let's test some of these ideas by by looking at venus and then whoops there it was great very unexpected. Now, RJ, if you had to, if you went into, if I backed you into a corner, do you think that this is probably the best indicator we've yet seen of microbial life on another body in the solar system? I mean, do you think this is the most exciting we've seen? Now, of course, Mars hints, we all know about that. Right. But do you think this is better? Uh, I think it's better than Mars, for sure. Or maybe not for sure. That's certainly a yeah subjective subjective uh, uh, point of view. But uh, I I saw I saw it mentioned like do, there's a very prominent guy in astrobiology and planetary habitability named Kevin Zonley, and he he said that he thinks Venus this Venus detection is probably the second most compelling behind seeing like potential biomolecules in the plumes of Enceladus. I think was what he said. So me not knowing in detail about the, the the materials and the plumes of Enceladus, I would probably, uh, you know, let Kevin Zonley <laughs> speak there. But uh, to this was the most exciting that I had seen until I saw him mention that the Enceladus possible biomolecules might be a more might be a more compelling thing. But I, I think this is more compelling than you know any anything that has happened with respect to Mars and Europa. Quite quite. Clearly to me anyway. I think it would be poetic in a way that for all of these years, we've been looking at Mars and to a large extent, Europa and mm -hmm. Enceladus for that matter. Mm -hmm. But the one place that we didn't think it would be, yeah, it was most obvious. Yeah, right. I totally, I, I think it's so funny that, you know, if this is actually a biosignature, then the first biosignature we detected beyond Earth is outside the habitable zone. That's kind of funny to me. <laughs> yes, just just inside. <laughs> right. Yeah, and that would I mean think about the implications of that because yeah. if this if this is a second genesis, a truly independent second genesis of life. Now, one can bring further questions into this, such as, um, hey, did these microbes originate on Earth, and did right. they get delivered there, or vice versa? Are we actually Venusians? Um, yeah. All these questions will be asked now as, as more is learned about this, providing it's confirmed. But I think the most interesting thing is that is if this is a separate genesis of life in the solar system, it happened on two worlds, not just yep. one, yep. then this must be one heck of a microbial universe. Do you agree with that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, I think like that uh, we really, really, really should try and do a sample return as soon as possible and <laughs> try and analyze those microbes if they're there. Because yeah, like, like you said, if, you know, if it's just, if it's panspermia, then like, you know, that's cool. That's interesting to learn that panspermia is pretty easy, but we kind of like, you know, that that's already kind of, that's thought to be the case, you know, that, I mean, you've, you've covered that type of thing in, in some detail, but uh, yeah, if it, <laughs> if it turns out to be an independent origination then it's like the most ridiculously important thing to ever be found in human history <laughs> in my, in my yeah. opinion and also you know it has somewhat disturb you know possibly disturbing implications and that it means that the quote unquote great filter can't be just the origin of life and it has to lie you know it it, it slightly increases the chances that the great filter lies in our future <laughs> which it which huh. would be bad uh, but you know that's that's a 
that's only a slight sadness to this if we find the independent abiogenesis. Well, uh, well, actually, the real sadness would be if, if Venus is continuing to die and that these microbes are there <laughs> right now, but they may not be there in 10 million years. <laughs> right. I don't think that would be the saddest scenario. Yeah. In which case, we have to go save them and keep them in a Petri dish here on Earth. Exactly. Until yes. until the luminosity of the sun bakes Earth, of course, and kills both the uh, planets off. True twins at that point. True twins. Would they become true twins at that point? Especially as they spiral into the giant, the red giant sun together. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Beautiful. Now, the this this idea of the great filter, though, that mm -hmm. it would be an indicator that the great filter lies in our future, which it's. I mean, frankly, not hard to envision that we could hit a great filter, you know, mm -hmm. even within the next few centuries. So we would see a microbial universe, but with very <laughs> rare intelligence. You know, number one, it's rare for it to ever arise. And number two, it's rare for it to survive. And that would be the reality of the universe as, as an right. indicator. Now, if we and saw... If we saw life or evidence of past life on Mars, in addition to Venus, say that this yeah. is confirmed, then we have a really crazy situation where you have yeah. three. <laughs> yep. Or, and then throw in Europa too. You know, we dig yep. into Why Europa not? and find space whales and, yep. you know, giant, <laughs> giant evil space jellyfish that try to eat anything that goes underneath the ice. So, the dream, the dream. At that point, it gets even spookier. Because yeah. you still have the great silence of yeah. not seeing any civilizations. Yeah, now, exactly. do you think, your gut feeling, do you think that at this point with Mars hinting, Europa looking great, Enceladus looking pretty interesting, and now Venus hinting strongly, mm -hmm. we probably have a very vibrant, alive solar system, don't we? That is my... my uh... Yeah, my that's my hope, you know, and and, and like my heart says that, <laughs> my heart and my gut both both point to that. But yeah, I definitely certainly would. It's entirely gut feeling, yeah. But because <laughs> it, they, you know, it's it's damn hard to prove life. Yeah, that, well, and you know, it would then, yeah. Also, if we find it on Mars, then yeah, then then the panspermia question, yeah, obviously becomes even even more more of a more of a difficult to answer thing. Like, did it? come from Mars to both Venus and Earth? Did it originate on two of the planets? Did it originate on all three independently? Yeah, it, uh, it's, uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm looking forward to the next 20 years, very much so. Very happy to just be starting in this field because that's a, uh, it's a very exciting period, I think. Well, I think it's the period where we're either gonna, we're, well, we have a very good chance of actually confirming this, that, yep. You know, we, we, life, I would not say we are not alone because I'm not sure we're ever going to see any evidence of an alien civilization, mm -hmm. but we could say life on earth is not alone. And yep. we not only have a way to do that by looking at places like Venus and Mars, but we can also do it in the laboratory and look at the chemistry of life and how it began, you know, the, the successors to the Miller-Urey experiments where we can say, okay, this is how life comes out of a test tube mm -hmm. and, you know, microbe comes out and we can say that's either very easy or it's very hard. And yep. if it's easy, then life is, again, the question is answered that life on Earth is not alone because it's very likely everywhere. Or yep. it's stupidly hard, in which case we have another <laughs> we have another question entirely. Why are we unique, you know? Either right. way, it's pretty pretty amazing questions to, to uh, be able to try to answer in the coming yeah. years. It's ridiculous, yeah. It's insane that, like, any that you can get e any information about those at the, about those questions. Like it's just com total, totally mind boggling that, you know, even if it's only just tiny little bits of information like this right now, like it's still just nothing else like this has, has been, has been possible ever before. Like what the heck? Oh man. Well, imagine, Sorry, still... imagine, imagine being on the early end of humanity where you're, you're sitting in a cave painting a picture of a Buffalo on the <laughs> cave wall you had absolutely no reference or any ability to even ask this question. And yeah. we happen to be right here, at right exactly the right time where we can ask the question and answer it. Right. It's, it's a bit strange. Yeah. That, whenever I ponder that, I get a little bit worried that it is a simulation or something like that. There, you know, that we're just being simulated at a very interesting point in history, but you know, that, hopefully that's not true, but you're absolutely right. Yeah. Like the, the, we didn't even have the concepts until, 50 60 100 years ago right and 
good lord, it's exponentially uh, progressing, it seems. Well, in, regards to, in regards to simulation theory, I have a pet hope regarding that. If that is the case and we are living in a simulation, I hope it's a dinosaur running the simulation <laughs> or like a pterodactyl or something that's like, I want to see what happens in the future. I think that would be, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think that'd be yeah. just really cool. He's like, what if, what if a meteor killed us? We should simulate that. <laughs> yes. Let's run a simulation on the idea of an asteroid striking the earth. <laughs> and what would happen after? <laughs> right. Exactly. Now, what do we do next? What's the next step in confirming this signal of phosphine and eliminating, you know, the process of elimination? Because, you know, people are thinking, how could you make phosphine without biology? What's the next right. step? How is this going to go? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you, you just mentioned, yeah, people are going to start thinking about how can we make phosphine without biology. And I think that's going to be very, you know, that's a lot of, uh, hopefully a lot of chemists, kind, you know, jump on this and really work hard because, the more pathways they rule out, the more the more likely it is to be life. And but if they do happen to stumble upon the right pathway, then that's we should find that out as early as possible. So hopefully, a lot of chemists are jumping on it right now. But you know, uh, uh, I'm of course hoping that we. I'm pretty sure that right now there's a possible Venus mission f like under consideration at NASA where they would send a balloon that would go and hang out in the clouds for a while and uh, might be able to do some more serious analysis of all the chemical species that are there. I think that is the huge, a huge priority now. <laughs> and I assume, I'm hoping NASA will agree and that this, that, uh, this potential mission gets funded to have a, yeah, some, a balloon floating around and scooping, scooping up stuff to look at really closely. Cause yeah, we're just very information poor right now, which is very frustrating. Isn't it amazing, though? A month ago, had we had this conversation, we would have been talking about Mars and how absolutely, Mars is, and that how we should go to Mars and prioritize Mars to for, in the search for life and astrobiology. Mm -hmm. That all changed in a day. It's yeah, now Venus. That's why we. Yeah, I mean, that's why that this sort of blue sky random stuff like. Who, who would have, yeah, I don't know, no one would have, yeah, it wouldn't have occurred to anybody to, to, to look for phosphine in Venus's atmosphere until quite recently. And that kind of out there idea should be pursued. <laughs> this, this is like such a beautiful example of why that type of stuff is so darn important. Because you're right, we, we might have just been barking up entirely the wrong tree with, <laughs> with which planet we were focusing on. It's, it's ridiculous. <laughs> Well, years. I think I think it's I think it's indicative of life surprises. You know, yeah. you never know what to expect from it. And here, lo and behold. But the one last thing I wanted to discuss with you real quick is this isn't really the first hint of life that Venus has given us. True. We yeah. see some strange stuff with Venus and yeah. ultraviolet. We see these weird patterns of dark, you know, mm -hmm. dark splotches and, you know, things that appear and change and look strangely enough like blooming algae things like that right. now presuming and this is a big presumption or assumption mm -hmm. that it's the same thing that's creating the uh, phosphine gas right we can study that from earth we don't even need to go to space or go to venus so we can sit there and watch presumably mm -hmm. migratory patterns of venusian microorganisms from the <laughs> comfort of home and that i'm sure somebody's going to be doing that you know quickly right uh, they better be yeah <laughs> i'll be angry at anybody that has access to the proper instruments and isn't trying as hard as they can to point them right at venus right now uh, and my point being is that we can study this from here right now yeah true absolutely and we're going to get we're going to glean more in a matter of months one way or another all right rj we are out of time thanks for joining us today well, I really appreciate you having me, and man, what an incredibly cool discovery, and I'm looking forward to hearing hearing a lot more about it here in the near future. Best discovery of the year, for sure. Maybe oh, best God. discovery in all of human history, if it gets confirmed. We'll see. Thanks for watching Event Horizon. If you want to know more about the Venus discovery, you can jump over to JMG's channel using the link in the description below. No, go away. What? Really? Okay. You have one new message.
Hey, where's the uh, Event Horizon podcast? There's rumours that it will be available soon. Oh, hold on, someone's at my door. End of messages.